So welcome to our uh, talk on ChatGPT and the future of the classroom. Um, we're excited to talk to you about this today because I think it's going to be something that's so important in all educational institutions. And there's been a lot of discussion about sort of what's going to happen in terms of people cheating and all this, but hopefully we can show you another side of that uh, today and all of the opportunities for innovation in the classroom using these new uh, large language models. So I'm Jules White, I'm an associate professor in computer science and an associate dean in the School of Engineering. We have Jesse Spencer Smith, who is the chief data scientist in the Data Science Institute and a professor of the practice and computer science, and then Doug Schmidt, who's Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Computer Science. And so we're going to try to present a number of different angles on how large language models, particularly ChatGBT, are going to impact the classroom and hopefully, you know, expand the conversation beyond just, is this a tool for cheating and are we, is this the end of the student essay? Because I think it's really much, much um, more capable of that. I think it's going to give us personalized learning, a lot of really exciting things. So I'm going to start off um, by talking a bit about, you know, why it's really important from an educational perspective, in my, in my you know, opinion, that it does make errors. So when we think about uh, ChatGPT, we've seen a lot in the news about, well, it produces content that has flaws. And I think this is actually an opportunity from an educational perspective. And I want to talk about why and, and give you an example of this. And so one of the things that we can do when we have um, a tool like ChatGPT is we can ask students to go and analyze a problem or a question using ChatGPT and then ask them to go and analyze the correctness or the accuracy of the output that it produces. And this is one of the things when you start thinking about this as a tool, you know, it is a productivity multiplier if you understand the domain that you're working in. So if you are a computer scientist and you understand how to write code and read code and debug code, it's okay that it makes errors because you can go and correct them and identify them. On the other hand, if you can't correct code, then you can't take its output and do something meaningful with it. So one of the important things is to teach people that it's a tool that helps you, but only if you understand the domain that you're working in and can take ownership of the code or take ownership of the text or the facts that, that it's supposedly presenting. If you don't understand its output, then you can't get there. So I'm gonna give you an example of this and how this can be turned into an assignment. So, um, you know, one of the really fascinating examples I saw on the internet uh, actually yesterday, and it changed my presentation, was somebody was using ChatGPT to look at how you would translate things into Babylonian cuneiform. I know nothing about Babylonian cuneiform, but I thought this would be a really interesting opportunity to go and try to learn something about it and as a kicking off point. So imagine that you gave somebody the assignment, you said, can you speculate on how you would translate computer science into Babylonian cuneiform. Go and use ChatGPT to do the translation, but you're gonna be responsible for analyzing the accuracy of its approach, whether or not it makes sense or not, and to discuss and you know really dig into this problem. So it's not something where you can just go and ask the question to ChatGPT and get an answer, but it's something where you go and ask it, but then you have to really think and reason and understand the domain in order to assess whether or not it's correct. So if you go and ask ChatGPT to translate computer science into Babylonian cuneiform, it goes and it has a really interesting example. I mean, answer, it basically says, you know, since Babylonian cuneiform was, was developed long before the concept of computer science, there's not going to be a direct translation. But, you know, just to paraphrase what it says, it says we can attempt to represent the concept using transliteration that captures the essence of computer science. And so basically what it comes down to is it says, we can break this into two parts, the word computer, and there wasn't a concept of computer in, in Babylon. So we can approximate it by referring to the concept of calculation. And so it says, we're gonna represent computer with the concept of calculation. And then it says science, that Babylonians had a keen interest in science. Um, and so we can go and take their word for knowledge or science, and combine that, and what's fascinating is it actually gives us its approximation of the cuneiform. So it's actually said, here's how we would go about doing it. So it's giving us an approach. It's saying these are the words that we're going to use for our approach. 
And then finally, it's given us the cuneiform. So now as somebody who knows nothing about this, I now have an interesting problem. If I wanted to go and decide whether or not this was correct or not, I'd have to go and understand does transliteration in this way make sense in Babylonian cuneiform? And I'd really have to dive in deep into the research and the, the literature on this. I couldn't just go and say, hey, translate it. But if I'm having to now represent the accuracy of it and discuss the accuracy of its approach, I have to understand, does transliteration make sense in, in this? Do, do these symbols actually make sense? Are they actual cuneiform? Or are they just random you know, characters that it spit out that look like cuneiform but aren't actually cuneiform? I have to go in and look through, is its translation of the word you know, for um, science correct? You know, I have all of this sort of complexity and depth now to the assignment. And so it doesn't just become something that ChatGPT can answer. But it gives this sort of rich, you know, interesting assignment to go and assess. And I also have to learn to take the output and own it and really go in and investigate it. So I, hopefully this kind of gives you a sense of how you can take something that, yes, it can answer questions, but you can turn it into something that's the beginning of an exploration for a student. Um, but one of the things that really excites me about ChatGPT and large language models in the classroom is the ability to create sort of custom either um, games or quizzes or assignments, all kinds of custom content that I wouldn't have the ability or the time to do within a class ordinarily. But ChatGBT allows me to do these types of things. So as an example of this, um, I did a quick example with my son where I said, I would like you to play a math game with my nine-year-old to teach him about division with fractions and nutrition, ask him questions one at a time involving Pokemon, and um, these topics and make it into a game when he wins the Pokemon win. So now I've created a custom game that's quizzing my son on math, nutrition, and Pokemon. Now you can imagine taking this into a class and you, based on your last class, you look at what people were struggling with and you mix together a series of concepts into a custom game that they can go and interact with and explore as a class. You know, doing something like this before would take so much time and energy to try to program it or you know, build this custom experience. But here I am, and in a paragraph of text, I can create a game. So if I put this into chat GPT, then what happens is it says, great, let's play a fun math game involving Pokemon and nutrition. And it asks the first question. It says, Pikachu and his friends are planning a meal that includes half a cup of cooked rice, but they need to divide it evenly among three Pokemon. How much rice will each Pokemon get? And it even gives hints, says that you can, you know, if you get stuck, you can ask for guidance. And then if you go in and you put in the right answer, um, like my son would be doing, so he would basically, he would pause and wait for his input. Then it goes and actually tells them how they're doing. Like, yes, that's correct. And then it works out the math and shows them the math behind it and then goes into the next question. And you can imagine if I needed to on the fly create a game or some custom experience around a set of topics before ChatGPT, I wouldn't have had the time um, and you know, capacity to go and build these custom um, educational experiences or games or quizzes. And now you can actually go and on-demand generate material for an individual in your class, for a group of people in your class that may be struggling with a particular concept. And you can also take things that may be more approachable to them. In the case of my, of my nine-year-old, it's Pokemon. So I can mix Pokemon in and make the, uh, the material more approachable. And so this ability to really quickly go and generate these educational experiences, I think is going to be something that's really helpful going forward. Um, one of the other things is you can also build really open-ended things. So because they make mistakes, you can you know, imagine going in and creating a virtual lab experience where you have real world things like circuits and wheels, and you want somebody to go and build a robot that they have to actually assemble but you give them chat GPT as the interface to go and discover and learn about building robots. And they're gonna to have to take the knowledge that they get, try it out in the real world, determine what doesn't work, and then go back and re-engage with chat GPT to try to explore it further. So just as a simple example of this, you can say, I wanna help you, ex I want you to help me explore a virtual lab for building robotics. The lab is in a university, introduce me to the lab. And chat GPT will say, okay, I'm a virtual lab. And you can design robots, you can test robots, and you can start interacting with ChatGPT in exploring the lab. You can say, can we design a robot together? And, and ChatGPT will follow up, yes, we can. 
We just, and it will then begin telling you the design process. We need to, you know, define the purpose, brainstorm concepts, and you can keep interacting with it and giving it more and more detail about what you're trying to do. Like I'm trying to build a robot, 3D print parts for it, have a circuit diagram from it, and then write code. And it'll start walking you through all of these different steps and allowing you to interactively explore the lab and telling you here are the different steps. You're going to need the components. You're going to have to test it, refine it, and improve it. And so you can then tell it, well, I want to build one of those robots that you know follows a line on the floor, which is something you see a lot in, in universities. And it'll tell you, okay, here are more information I need. And so it's basically leading somebody through the design process interactively. And again, all I started out with was a paragraph of text. I said, I want to create a virtual lab and I want you to um, help me explore this virtual lab. And now I'm actually walking through this laboratory experience and you can go all the way down to actually creating and choosing components. So these are actually um, real components, real um uh, circuitry that you could assemble into a robot. And what's kind of interesting is I ran into the, the person who lead, the faculty member that leads the capstone design pro, um, experience for the engineering school. And he said, you know, the, the, the components that it chose are exactly what I would have chosen if I was building the robot that was there. And I actually know nothing about this circuitry. So it felt, made me feel good that it was actually heading in the right direction. Um, and you can also go and have it you know, choose things for you where maybe you don't have as much information and you can get all the way down to actually having it generate the code, which I do know a lot about. And I've looked at the code as it, you know, uh, generated for this line following robot and it's correct as well. Um, and you can go and interact and have it explain things. And when you get to the end, um, you can even get to the point where you've gone through this whole interactive experience and it says, now ask me questions about the experience to really assess my knowledge. And so this is a really complex back and forth simulation that before something like ChatGPT, we couldn't have built this type of educational experience. Um, so I'm going to hand it off now to uh, Doug Schmidt, who's going to uh, talk as soon as I figure out how to stop sharing here. Um, let's see here. It's hiding. There we go. Um, who's going to talk more about his experiences in using this in the classroom. Great, thanks very much, Jules. Hopefully everybody can see my screen here. I'm gonna to talk today about some of the experiences we've had to this point, applying various tools, including ChatGPT and other plugins that you can get now in modern interactive development environments for programming languages like Java to computer science courses that we're teaching here at Vanderbilt. So I have been teaching a course for a number of years that focuses on designing, programming, and testing concurrent and parallel microservices for a range of computing platforms. And these include things like mobile devices, laptops, cloud environments, and so on. And if you're curious, you can take a look at the link at the bottom of the slide to actually see what we teach in the class. This course, this last semester involved developing a movie recommendation system for web-based applications. So you could query it and find out what movies you might wanna watch based on other things you've watched. This is something at Vanderbilt we call a, a mezzanine course, which means it's available to both undergraduates and graduate students. And one of the things that made this particular context for applying these tools relevant is that we're not dealing with rank beginners, we're dealing with people who have some experience. And that's one of the tricky issues we're still wrestling with in our curriculum is how to figure out how to introduce these tools at the right time. Because if you do it too early, it discourages people from learning the right set of skills that will make them effective throughout their careers. So here's some examples of how I've actually used these things in my class. So my particular goal was to make me a more effective teacher in terms of the examples I give my students, the assignments I give my students, and perhaps more importantly, the methods and techniques that I'm trying to convey upon them so they'll be more effective as they learn and grow as professionals in this field. So one of the things that I found very quickly was there's a bunch of topics that I was generally familiar with, but really hadn't delved into detail for various reasons, because it was not my particular area of research or interest. But when you're starting to teach modern courses like microservices that are very popular these days, you have to broaden yourself. You have to become a more effective educator. And I just had historically not had time to learn about how to program some of these interfaces and some of these capabilities, in particular, things like databases. Now, in the past, I would reach out to Jules, who, who is an expert at these topics, and he would help me, but that didn't really scale. And it, it felt kind of wrong to keep bugging him all the time. So 
I figured I would start leveraging ChatGPT to see if it could fill in the gaps in some of my own education and knowledge. So one of the things I learned to do very quickly was use the natural language prompts that are so facile and so easy to work with with ChatGPT to generate various methods for querying databases. So I could say things like, um, please generate a spring data API that finds all the movie rows in a database that contain a query string, ignoring case, and return them sorted in ascending order. And boom, within about two seconds, ChatGPT generated the code for me that I needed to show for my examples and also to use for my assignments. I also got it to explain to myself and to my students what was actually taking place under the hood. What were the queries that were being done on the underlying database? And it would tell me, given a description in the natural language form, then it would go ahead and tell me what was happening under the hood in terms of a structured query language query, which was very helpful to give people a more holistic view of what's happening. I was also able to use ChatGPT to generate sample code using some advanced techniques that I, to that point, had not really become aware of. And while I could have learned this the old fashioned way, it would have taken me quite a long time. And so I wanted to find a way to teach myself these topics and see if I could use ChatGPT as a mentor to help me out. So I was able to get it to generate custom queries, which was something that would have taken quite a long time if I tried to Google or read manuals or do this in a more traditional way. I also got it to explain how I could integrate this code in with other code that was in my project, which made me much more productive. One of the greatest things about using these tools, and this is true both with ChatGPT itself in the chatbot mode, as well as the new tools that are coming out that integrate it into your programming environment, things like Code Whisperer or the GitHub Copilot. There's a whole bunch of other tools that are on their way as well. You can actually get them to generate code and or generate comments for you. Nobody likes to write comments. So I use the tools to generate the comments and they're often more insightful and more thorough than I would generate given the amount of time I'm willing to put into commenting my code. You can also do other things, generate dependencies so you can work appropriately with the right libraries and other things that you need in order to make your applications work. One of the interesting quirks of ChatGPT at the moment is it doesn't know things that occurred after September 2021. So newer libraries, newer features, and so on are often something it doesn't know enough about to tell you. So you still have to rely on other more traditional techniques like Google searching to help you out there. And I'll talk about this in a second when we talk about ways of integrating, integrating these mechanisms into your courses to try to reduce cheating. I was also able to get the tools to generate explanations of clever solutions my students used where I often didn't know quite what they were doing at first glance. So I would provide ChatGPT with some code snippets and it would tell me what was going on. And then I could also say, I, I like that solution, but I'd like to do it in a different format using more modern mechanisms that might be available in newer versions of Java or C++. And it will automatically make those transformations without me having to sit there laboriously trying to do that by hand. Moreover, ChatGPT is very patient and very broad in its knowledge. So it'll actually do these things in multiple languages. I can generate the same solution in a modern popular language like Python, and I can also generate it in much more esoteric older languages like Ada. I learned to program Ada back in the middle 80s. I haven't programmed Ada in 25 or more years. It was able to generate code that would have taken me weeks to try to re-engineer based on knowledge I had gained and forgotten decades ago. Another great thing you can do with these tools is generate unit tests. When you're writing code, it's very important to know whether the code works correctly. This is very important for modern test-driven development approaches that are popular in agile methods. And so I could use ChatGPT to generate unit code. And there's also tools now that exist that will generate very extensive unit tests in popular programming languages like JavaScript, Java, C++, Python, and so on, as well as popular interactive development environments like IntelliJ, Android Studio, and so on. And I just started playing with this stuff a couple of days ago, and it's really fantastic at generating these unit tests that we can then augment and improve and provide them as ways of ensuring that the code our students write work correctly for their programming assignments. I can also do other things. When people ask me questions in our chat boards in the class, our discussion forums, I can often get better insights by asking ChatGPT to refresh my memory about certain topics that I probably knew 20 years ago, but may have forgotten or become a bit rusty on over time. So once again, this makes me a much more effective presenter. So just to kind of summarize here, some general strategies for using ChatGPT effectively in class. I find it very useful to encourage students to use ChatGPT in class rather than trying to keep them 
from doing it. Uh, I think it's it's kind of hard. The uh, the horses left the barn, or whatever your favorite analogy is, and it's difficult to prevent people from using these tools. So let's make sure we use them effectively and ethically. One thing that happens, of course, is we got to rethink how we do programming assignments. We have to rethink how we do quizzes and exams because it's always tempting for students to apply these tools in places they probably shouldn't, like in a in a quiz where you're not supposed to use the internet or your notes or anything. You have to do with what's in your brain. So one thing I try to do is I try to make my assignments more open-ended without giving people as much hand-holding requirement specification detail so they can then leverage the missing pieces by using ChatGPT to fill in, fill in the blanks. And this is a really great way for getting them to learn how to use these tools and also to get them to learn the pros and cons because things don't always work out of the box every time as we'll discuss throughout this, this webinar. Something else I try to do is make the quizzes or the exams difficult, even if students inappropriately happen to use ChatGPT. They're not supposed to, but sometimes they do anyway, especially if they're online quizzes and exams. So one thing I try to do is to try to make the exams and quizzes more contextual. I'll ask questions from things we discussed in class, which has two benefits. One, it encourages people to come to class. And secondly, it also makes it next to impossible to use ChatGPT because ChatGPT wasn't in class and it only knows things from September 2021 or before. Likewise, I also try to use features and mechanisms that are more recent. So there's certain things that have come out in the last couple of months or maybe the last year. And if I incorporate those in my assignments, then people can't just trivially cut and paste and get ChatGPT to generate the answers. Naturally, this is not a fully perfect solution because I'll have to keep updating my courses to keep up with the pace of advances with these language models, but it's a way to do it for now. I also definitely encourage students to understand both the benefits and the limitations of using these kinds of tools. And believe me, if you use them for even a short amount of time, you quickly realize the benefits and the limitations. ChatGPT and other language models work very good on topics where it's been trained using lots of good examples. So if you stick with programming languages, if you stick with features and questions that are popular, things like Python or Java, JavaScript, you're in good shape. If you start using things that are really esoteric, it's sometimes harder to get it to give you sensible answers. Moreover, as you'll quickly discover when you use it, it has a tendency to hallucinate, which means it gives you incorrect answers as confidently and enthusiastically as it gives you correct answers. And so, that happens, of course, because it's been trained in ways that are based on incorrect data. And so sometimes it gets confused and, and tells you things that aren't really true. So in my experience, ChatGPT is most effective when we use it to supplement rather than supplant the learning process. And that's why figuring out where to integrate it into the curriculum is so important because you want people to have good habits and basic skills before you start allowing them to leverage their AI chat buddy to help fill in the gaps in their knowledge. Another thing that's worth pointing out is that these AI tools are going to be here for the foreseeable future, and they matter because it's going to change the way we build software. Right now, we mostly do it through people and teams and Googling and reading manuals, and increasingly, we're going to be use it where we're going to have humans working together with AI tools in a trustworthy manner. And of course, that requires the tools to be trustworthy and for us to make sure we can verify what they're doing. But it's worth taking a look at a a national agenda study I did a couple of years ago with the Software Engineering Institute in Pittsburgh, where we tried to anticipate where the world's going in software. And we discovered, to no one's surprise, that AI and humans are going to work together. So rather than having to write everything by hand using what people think about, we'll be working with it the way that tools can augment us to give us a better advantage to work more effectively on complicated challenges that are hard for individuals to keep track of the details manually. Soon, everyone will be a programmer. This is something that we talk a lot about in our research here at Vanderbilt. Everybody's going to be using these tools to get answers, to do other kinds of things. And so you'll be programming large language models, whether you realize it or not. Some of us will go on and do programming with more traditional languages or, or modern languages, but everybody's going to know how to customize and approve, improve the context in which the way they interact through something called prompt engineering. One of the great things about this is it allows us to refocus on the more creative aspects and the architectural aspects of how we build software rather than having to focus on mundane details. And that's what I find most rewarding in my use. I don't have to worry about details anymore as much. I can focus on the really interesting things 
to make me a more effective teacher and hopefully make my students more effective in their lifelong goal of becoming professionals that will be able to go out and do great things and build upon the techniques and tools we have today. So I think we're going to hand it over to Jesse now. That's right. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more about other ways to use uh, ChatGPT and other large language models, in particular, using them as a tutor. So uh, uh, recently, the most recent, uh, oh, let me go ahead and share the correct screen here. Uh, in the most recent edition of MIT Technology Review, uh, there was uh, an op-ed written by uh, a high schooler, and by written by Rohan Mehta, and he made an observation that uh, that I really liked about about the use of ChatGPT. And what he said was, uh, "What's really important is to that that having this it adds up to a simple but profound fact: anyone with an internet connection now has a personal tutor, without the costs associated with private tutoring." Sure, an easily hoodwinked, slightly delusional tutor, but a tutor nonetheless, which I thought was a great way of, of thinking about it. So I decided that now was going to be the time for me to learn Spanish. So I wanted to see if I could learn Spanish and see what the experience would be like to learn Spanish in sort of the traditional way, but also to be using these large language models. I'm going to show you just one interaction that I've had to give you an idea of the, 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 the power of using these models as, as tutors. So one of the things that I was confused about was uh, uh, me gusta, you know, I, 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 which I was reading as I like, which turns out not to be quite right. So I said, I translated, Jesse likes the new computer into Spanish. And I wrote, Jesse gusta la computadora and got it wrong. Why? So... Uh, uh, GPT-4 came back and said, well, the sentence, Jesse likes a new computer, translate to, a Jesse la gusta la nueva computadora into Spanish. And then it goes on to explain why, that, that we say we, we like in a very different way in Spanish than we do in English. And it goes and explains, explained to me in a way that I really understood. And so what I found was that I didn't make this mistake anymore. I had been making this mistake regularly until the tutor showed me how to think about it differently. So hugely uh, 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 useful. But then I was wondering, well, what about math? Um, we know that the, that the models are trained on math, but uh, you know, can, can, it, can it also serve as a tutor for math? So I decided, okay, I'm gonna see, what is it, uh, can it tell me what a derivative is and maybe help me understand it? So take the first derivative of this term, x, x uh, to the third plus four times x squared plus two times minus two x plus three. And it does a pretty good job. The first derivative of a function can be found by using the power rule for differentiation. So it, it showed me that and then it broke it down and then it gave me what the answer was. Uh, and that was, uh, that was not bad. Um, it wasn't, didn't give me a lot of extra explanation, but it, but it wasn't bad. So impressive, but it could be better. As we've talked about uh, in, in the first uh, of our workshops here, the models are caught in time. So the models themselves were trained. GPT-3 was trained, uh, uh, ChatGPT was ended training in June of 2021. GPT-4 ended its training in November of 2021. And that's the world that they know up to that point. So how do you reach out to the broader internet? How do you update the knowledge uh, that, uh, that the model has available to it? How do you give it powers that it doesn't have right now? And the answer is you use plugins. So plugins are a way to empower the model to go and look things up or to get answers. Model is not great at doing arithmetic. Great, it knows when you ask it arithmetic that it needs to go and pull up a calculator. Pulls up the calculator, does the work, brings it back into the context and then continues giving you the answer. So let's see what happens when I ask it to take the first derivative of this, but I give it access to a really powerful plugin called Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha, separate service released around 2016, I think. You know, certainly does math. It, it has lots of factual information all crammed in, but its interface is, you know, it's not a chat bot. It's not going to sort of explain things. It just gives you a bunch of information. So 
This puts the chat GPT, or in this case, GPT-4 as the front end. It knows when you ask it something that it really needs a better guidance on. And so it asks Wolf from Alpha for more information, then it returns it all to you. Let's see what it does. So in this chat, I asked the same thing, but then I went ahead and said used, and I'm going to regenerate the response here. So take the first derivative of this, and it's using Wolf from Alpha. So what it's doing right now is it's sending out the information, this query, to Wolf from Alpha, and then it's going to interpret the results and then bring it back. So it gives me uh, gives me the first derivative. Owen looks at formats it nicely. So now this is like proper mathematical format. But then look what it's going much further now. So it's saying, oh, by the way, that first derivative was a parabola. The roots of that first derivative are these. The polynomial discriminant is 88. The domain is the following. And notice that it's actually, if you watch it right here, it's actually writing it in, uh, uh, in something that is then interpreted and then formatted correctly. Oh, it's even going to give me graphs. So now it's, uh, it's, it's starting to generate some graphs here. It'll take a moment for it to come out. So this is going far, far beyond what the models themselves can do. But with the plugins, it gives it great additional capabilities. So you still have the conversational front end that understands you and will take the feedback that it gets and turns it into sort of a teaching moment. So really quite, quite powerful. Let's see what it does with the Spanish question that I had before. The, the answer that we had before wasn't bad, but what happens if you use a plugin that's specifically around teaching languages? Well, this is what I got. So I put the same, I translated Jesse likes the new computer into Spanish. Jesse gusta la computadora, and I got it wrong. Why? So now it goes in and it explains very similarly to how it did before, but now it goes beyond. It said, here's some other ways to express the same idea. If you want to have positive tone or slangy tone or exaggerated tone, uh, then it gives me an example of a conversation in Spanish. This is the first tutor was a good tutor. <laughs> this tutor expanded by the plugins is an excellent tutor. And this is really just uh, the beginning. And this is what you're going to be seeing more and more. Plugins will become very generally available uh, uh, shortly. They're available uh, right now if, if, you, if you sign up. But this will allow you to do things like you talk about restaurants and then it can make reservations for restaurants for you. Uh, it can look up information. It can look up things on the web, expanding the capability of the models. Let's go and take a look at, uh, at another way of using these models. So we use them for, uh, for uh, tutoring and we can see that's really quite useful. Um, let's say I want to create a quiz. So I'm an instructor and I want to create a quiz or I'm a student and I want to quiz myself. Uh, early Roman Empire. So here what I'm saying is quiz me on the early years of the early Roman Empire. Give me 10 numbered multi-choice questions with four possible answers. Tell me if I'm wrong, tell me why it's wrong and what the correct answer is. So here are the 10 questions. Who was the first emperor of the Roman Empire? Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Nero, Caligula. What was Pax Romana? What was not a reason for the fall of the Roman Empire? It's actually really pretty questions, good questions. I studied this in middle school, so I only remember a little, a few of these, but let's see what it does for the answers. So it told me, please respond with all your answers in the following format. So I did. And then it goes through and it gives me the answers. Ah, I said B, Augustus Caesar. Um, that was the answer. And I answered uh, that it was, uh, I gave the wrong answer. I said Julius Caesar on purpose. I did know the answer. Uh, and it said, well, yeah, no, Julius Caesar was a transitional figure. And then, you know, going forward, uh, uh, Pax Romana was relative peace. These are actually pretty good, pretty good answers. So there are, you can use this, students can use this interactively. Teachers can use this for low stakes, what's called formative assessments, where you create a ton of these and you give them the students, it's a great way for students to test how they're doing. What I do in my classes is I also put a bug bounty. So in case it gives you a wrong answer, students get lots of extra credit if they find out that it gave a wrong answer, if it slipped in without my knowing, any wrong information. So it makes some critical observers, critical uh, users uh, of this type of, uh, of, of generation. But there's still a problem here. 
we're asking the model to generate its questions based on its own knowledge. And in an answer that I just uh, uh, put uh, in the uh, QA chat, uh, one way to think about these models is that they have like a fuzzy JPEG of the internet. Some things are very good, they're very detailed, some things are kind of fuzzy. So how do you create quizzes and, 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 and other types of, of, uh, of instruments with information that you know is right, and maybe just on your chapter, you know, a chapter out of a book, something that you've written, how do you point it directly to that? It turns out there are two good ways to do that. One is using a framework that's called LangChain. And uh, if you have questions about it, be happy to answer in the questions. We're actually teaching a course on this right now, uh, and we'll be rerunning the course. It will be open to you all as well if you want to learn more about this. Uh, but LangChain is one way for you to sort of combine the large language models with data stores, vector stores. And so it knows where to go and look up to get information to answer. But there's something that was announced Thursday. Then things move fast in this world. Thursday called long context. Long context is uh, long context is a is a way to have much more information in the context. Normally in the context you get maybe a couple of paragraphs. With long context, you can take an entire chapter or even entire book and literally paste it in. It has 100,000 tokens, about 75,000 words that you can paste in there and then immediately ask it questions. So I took this open textbook library, Introduction to Philosophy. I took chapter one, the entire first chapter. I pasted it into the model. It's called Claude. So here you can see I pasted in the entire thing. And what I want to do is I want to get a quiz on it. So here's a book chapter on philosophy. Here's the entire thing. It is quite, quite long. So what is the very first thing that it does? Well, it gives me a summary. This is nearly instantaneous. It was shocking how fast this was. I read through the chapter. It did a really pretty good job of summarizing what that chapter was and gives you sort of links to within the article, it's, uh, within the chapter itself. But then I asked, please quiz me on this material. So now I'm not asking the model to quiz me on what it knows or what it was trained on as of November, 2021, but rather using only the information in this book chapter, quiz me. And here's what it did. This is definitely information that's from the chapter. Uh, I definitely did very poorly on this. Um, I gave my answers here. And then it, it gave me the answers that wasn't great. It said, the, the answers are. So I said, please give me five multiple choice questions. Give me reasons. So it did a better job this time. Gave me questions. And then it gave me answers. And when I answered, you picked B, the passage actually says. So it told me and gave me feedback. These are extremely powerful tools. The long context is going to be it's going to turn out to be incredibly important uh, for a wide variety of uses, not just in education, but well beyond education as well. It's, uh, it's, it's entirely changing uh, how we're going to be able to, uh, to, to work with these. And I'll, I'll, I'll end here uh, by, by talking about uh, something that, that we started here at the Data Science Institute that, uh, that we're starting over the summer, and that is building solutions for instructors using LangChain. So here's your large language model. And the idea here is we're able to build and put different tools to supplement that large language model and actually come up with, uh, with, with answers. And what we're doing is we're working with instructors here at Vanderbilt, but also uh, secondary, uh, so high school teachers as well. And we're building them tools for them to use in their classroom. So uh, with the, the high school teachers, uh, we're working with the teachers uh, teaching English as a second language and actually taking some of the examples that you're seeing here, turning them into tools that they can use either in preparation of materials that they will give to the students or that will be uh, directly available to the students. And there's a wide variety of projects that we're taking on. Everything from, again, learning English 
to working with uh, Professor Holly uh, Tucker at, uh, at Vanderbilt to help her turn into a, a program, this cool way she has of teaching the French Revolution, which is to treat it as a role-playing game. And in the role-playing game, sometimes the king gets to stay in power. It all has to do with how well you write your letters to the different uh, uh, supporters, see if you can get support from the colonies or from, from others. And so we'll be building a solution that uses the language models to actually interact with the students, whereas before she had to have lots of uh, people running the games for her. So hopefully that gave you an overview of the different ways that you can use these models uh, and uh, you know, both in the classroom and also personally as a tutor. I personally am terrifically excited about learning new things using these models. I've, it's been a while since I've had quite so much fun just learning brand new things. Could be a cuneiform, uh, you know, could be learning another language. It makes it accessible, uh, makes it very fun. Let's go ahead and we'll open up to questions. We also have some previous questions that people had asked as well. Um, uh, let's go ahead and answer a few of the live questions that we have here. Uh, what was the textbook for the, uh, uh, what was the, uh, uh, the link for the uh, online? Uh, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll link, I'll put a link right in here to uh, uh, the textbook that I used right here. It's called Open Textbook. Another question from Kate was, how do you know when to trust chat GPT information versus Doug Schmidt's reference to it, hallucinating on topics of limited quality training sets? So one way is, I'll, I'll just answer from, from mine and then Doug will open up to you all. Um, for, for me, a big difference is using LangChain, so you're pointing it to particular documents from which it must draw. Then it's, it can still hallucinate, but it's far less likely to do that. Uh, that's an area of ongoing research right now, how to control it to make sure that you can absolutely trust what uh, information you're getting out of it. Uh, but the other way is also to use these long context models like Claude, uh, where you give it everything it's supposed to be using. Jules and Doug, did you have other answers for that? Oh, yeah, Doug, I mean, I think that's... Uh, unmute. Um, Go ahead, it's definitely, you know, using prompt engineering techniques to give it new information is one way to do it. So say you know, format the information, you know, give it bullet points and other things that are easy to refer back to and say, now produce a, you know, an analysis and refer back to the information that I gave you before. So it has to refer back to what you gave it. And so, you know, you can go and then look at and compare, you know, what is it saying that it gave you and is it correct? Another thing is like, you know, in computer science, I think we have an advantage in this domain and that if it produces code, I can look at it but then I can run it and check if it's correct or not. Does it produce the right output? And I can have it, you know, like Doug mentioned, producing the tests for it as well. Um, and then, you know, obviously other domains, it gets trickier because if you don't know the domain and you don't know how to check if it's correct or not, you know, that's, that's much more difficult. But there's different tricks you can give it where you say, you know, I'm going to give you information. You have to cite from the information that I gave you. Or you can ask it to list a, a set of facts, for example, that its analysis depends on. So maybe you don't give it an, you don't give it any information. You just ask it a question, but you say, "Give me a list of fundamental facts that your analysis depends on," and then you could go follow up on those facts. And you can also compare the facts to the information that it gave you and say, "Did it capture everything?" So th those are some ways to do it as well. So in addition to those good technical approaches, I think the more philosophical thing to reflect upon here is that. We should always be skeptical about anything we get from any source these days for all kinds of different reasons. And so ChatGPT, as, as Jesse is fond of telling us, is, is no better than the thing it's trained on. And a lot there's a lot of misinformation out there. So just like we should be skeptical when we get information from the web in general, we should also make sure we, we trust but verify. As Jewel, Jules pointed out, it is a little easier in the computer science world because you can compile the code to see if it compiles. You can test it. You can run it. In other domains, it's harder, but as always, make sure that you look for alternative sources to try to provide additional fact checking on whatever it is you're you're getting from your large language models or any other tool that you you find these days on the internet. All right, then we have a another question. Can you expand uh, on thought uh, about professors using uh, GPT detectors on students' uh, work when they can be inaccurate? Actually, uh, it, I, I will share a, a story that uh, that just came out. I'll I'll, I'll share the uh, the write up in, in Rolling Stone. 
Uh, so it points out uh, a professor from Texas A&M that actually flunked a, a number of students, quite a few students, um, because he thought that they had cheated using ChatGPT. But what he did was he took what they'd written, put it into ChatGPT, and asked ChatGPT, did you write this? Now, remember, ChatGPT will hallucinate, right? And in this case, in some of those, it said, yes, I, either I did write it or I could have written it. And he took that as evidence that they had written. But again, you can't just be just believe everything that's come from ChatGPT, especially in this. That is absolutely not how you would check if someone had cheated. And so this was a great example of a misuse of ChatGPT, where a lot of students paid the price. They were able to walk, but they actually had their you know diplomas withheld until they could prove that they had not cheated when there was really no evidence uh, that they had. And there's related tools that people can use for various purposes to try to show how something was created. Um, my son goes to a school and up till this semester, they'd given a sonnet writing assignment in one of his English classes. And this semester for the very first time, the professor didn't do that because he wasn't sure that he could provide evidence that people had got it from their brains rather than asking ChatGPT to write sonnets. By the way, ChatGPT is very good at writing sonnets. And so he later, his professor later found out that there's other tools like something called Draftback, which is a plugin for Google Docs, which will keep track of the keystrokes that are used to write a document. And so there are various ways you can try to get ahead of these uh, ways of cheating by using ChatGPT. They're not perfect. I'm sure we'll have what's called an arms race here very soon. Will there be <laughs> tools that will help you cheat and other tools that will help detect that you're cheating and so on? But this is really, again, no different from the arms race we have going on with deep fakes for videos, deep fakes for voice, voice mimicry, where you have to find ways of automatically detecting fakes. And this is just gonna be a, a chronic problem we have, especially when you consider the fact that anybody who's really clever at using these tools is going to do some thorough editing of the output in order to be able to disguise the fact that they got the information from, from a large language model in the first place. I would just add to one of the things I, I worry about in the talking about detecting is that when you start talking about detecting, like it's cheating if you're using these tools, and it certainly could be if you're if you're in a context where you're told not to use them. But when you're constantly talking about detecting it as if it's a bad thing that somebody needs to hide, you know, then you create this perspective that students are going to start feeling like if they touch the tool that they're doing something wrong. And so I think it's it's pretty evident that these tools are going to touch every discipline. I mean, that's my perspective. So other people obviously feel differently, but I think they're going to clearly have a huge impact on lots and lots of different domains. And it's really important that students be educating themselves. And then also, you know, courses are reworked to account for the fact that these tools are going to be out there and they're not going away. So detect in many cases is like a band-aid, you know, of like, I don't want to redo my course material to account for them. You know, in some cases, there are ways of redoing the material to account for these tools. And, you know, basically instructors need to think about how do they re-architect their course to account for the fact that, you know, very soon, more than likely, every word processing program is going to have it built in directly, and you would have to go out of your way to actually turn it off, you know. And so when we live in a world where the default is, is that it's going to be used in, in all kinds of things, we have to re you know, re-architect our education to account for that. Um, at the same time, there are certain things where you probably do want to just know that the person can do it from scratch. And, you know, if it if it comes down to resorting to giving a quiz out with pencil and paper and saying no computer is open, well, we'll do it that way if you really need to do it that way. But I think it's you have to I, I worry when there's a lot of talk about, you know, cheating and detection and, you know, trying to hold on to assignments and things the way they have been done and creating this sort of negative perception to where students aren't educating themselves like they should be about it. Let's see, we also had um, a question submitted previously on the topic of continuing education. It seems reasonable to assume that ChatGPT will have similar impacts on jobs. How can graduates continue their education to learn about how to effectively use or not use ChatGPT in our jobs? Um, it's a very quickly moving field. Uh, I mentioned to you that that long context model that Claude 100,000 uh, 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 length context came out Thursday. That's less than a week ago, and is is causing us to rethink how 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 we're approaching some of the uh, the problems that we're solving. So really, um, 
it's it, it it is necessary to continue to keep on top of of what's happening one way to do it is you know through programs like this uh, and also, uh, you know, Vanderbilt, we're also offering, you know, continuing education uh, in, in multiple forms. You know, the the work, the workshops that the Data Science Institute is putting on are open to graduates. We, we welcome people to come and learn about the uh, the latest uh, and what that might mean. Um, it's going to be moving very quickly, at least for a while. It should be settling down about the, you know, the, cap the capabilities uh, at some point. Uh, but right now it, it pays to take time to keep informed and to find out what's new absolutely i saw a relevant meme the other day that said you're not going to lose your job to ai you're going to lose your job to someone who uses ai and i think that's really the key thing to remember here is that especially in an information centric type of workforce where many of us play education being one of the obvious ones these tools are going to make it a leveling of the playing field for people who know how to use them effectively. And it may also lead to a widening of the gap between those who know how to use them effectively and those who don't. Mm -hmm. Kind of the, the digital chasm relative to the digital divide that we've talked about. Digital divide just used to mean people had access to the internet and some people didn't. Now, digital chasm means some people know how to use these tools, some people don't and use them effectively. The good news here is that the barrier to entry is ridiculously low. So you can start today, you can get your account at OpenAI, and start using this, find the good, bad, the ugly of these tools. But I think you'll find very quickly that you can make yourself much more productive, depending, of course, on what you do. But I use it for all kinds of stuff, mostly related to my programming courses and the research that we're doing. But I also use it for many other things as well, in conjunction with other tools. So anything that people can do to make themselves more facile with these emerging technologies, as Jesse said, is going to be a big win down the road. Yeah. I would just add on to what Doug said. I mean, the barrier to entry is really low. And I think the first step is to get and use the tool and try it out. And then to echo what Jesse said, I mean, the Data Science Institute has all kinds of um, different, you know, courses that go into depth, workshops, you know, there's lots of different things out there in terms of the sort of the length and format that you're looking for. I'll also just post a link in the chat. There's a Coursera course that Vanderbilt has on prompt engineering for ChatGPT. That's another option. So there's a whole variety of things through Vanderbilt in terms of, you know, week-long things and you know multi-week things there's there's all kinds of opportunities and so definitely avail yourself of those but i think you know also just get access like doug said and, and try out things with chat gpt particularly in your discipline and look at how what it can do what it can't do where it's accurate where it's not um, and then take the things you learn either from the data science institute or online or for the coursera courses these types of things and and, and experiment with them but for those of you who have a connection to Vanderbilt, we'll be having uh, rolling out a number of different opportunities to take these courses in a more systematic and, and disciplined way. We have an online master's program, which will start rolling out courses. We're also going to be rolling out some continuing education short courses that will focus on topics like prompt engineering and using the large language models effectively and, and other tools that are there for making you more productive. So keep your eye on this space and feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to give you pointers on what's coming down the pike. Dr. Dr. Yaw asks, can anyone call themselves a prompt engineer on their resume if you think you're pretty good or do you have to have actual credentials? There are no credentials uh, for a prompt engineer right now, uh, but uh, it becomes pretty apparent very early on if you're not able to get the models to do everything you need them to do. So you might get hired, but it might be a short career. Um, so uh, one thing that I think is, is helpful with prompt engineer is understanding deeply what's happening with the models, how they, how they work. So it's not just, are you saying the magic word? It, understanding the models and how the context plays into what's generated from the model is, is, uh, is, is rather important. Although Dr. Yaw, I think you could probably be a prompt engineer. Uh, what about limitations of AI because it is based on algorithms? Will it ever be creative in a synthetic sense? Um, so I, I, I think there's certain types of creative creativity that's good at. So if it's, um, but I think a lot of it is driven by human. So like if you ask it to combine the right interesting things, it's very creative in how it combines things. So um, if if you ask it the right questions and the human puts in the right creative, you know, things to pull together, I think it's extremely creative. So if you take if you say take these two very different things and combine them, or even in the image generation, a lot of the really exciting things are saying take these different styles and and concepts and combine them into an image. 
And so I still think of the human as really the driver of the creativity, mm -hmm. but in the details of how it gets done, it's really sort of filling in the details. So I think there is creativity in what it's doing and sort of how it's combining the patterns that it's seen in the past. Um, but I still think the human is the driver behind it. I have a it's, question from uh, Elizabeth. Oh, I'm sorry, Doug, go ahead. Yeah, it's fascinating because creativity, of course, is a shifting issue. People used to think that being able to play chess really well was a great example of human intelligence and creativity. And it still is for humans, but computers are now able to do it better than pretty much anybody. I guess in this particular context, what we have to keep in mind is that chat GPT and other language models are much more patient than humans typically are at taking a look at the big picture. So when I go to write code, I typically know APIs and methods that I'm familiar with, but I haven't necessarily read the entire manual. ChatGPT has read the entire manual. And so it will often come up with solutions I never would have thought of because it has access to things that in my limited sense as a human with limited amounts of time have only focused on the things that were particularly important to me at a given point in time, whereas it is much more comprehensive. So depending on how you define creativity, it'll often come up with solutions that a person might not because it has a more holistic view since it's not relying on sleep or exercise or calories in order to be able to get its energy to do its job. I have a question from Elizabeth Dell. Will you have any seminars for those of us in humanities disciplines? Absolutely. We, we've had some. We will definitely be having more uh, in the, uh, uh, especially in the, in the fall semester, you'll be seeing many more uh, uh, seminars. And um, uh, so we, we've, uh, this is not just for folks in computer science. As a matter of fact, last week I gave two different talks to a large group of travel agents. So uh, people in all different areas and uh, not just disciplines, but uh, work areas are interested in this as well. So yes, uh, we will, uh, I, I think we'll, we'll probably be able to send out a, a link uh, where you can uh, go to a webpage, sort of keep track of what's happening around generative AI uh, here at Vanderbilt, and, and we'll certainly be listing all of those there. Um, we're almost at the end of time. We'll take just a quick moment to give you a heads up of what's coming next. Google has uh, last week uh, released uh, the latest version of their uh, uh, generative AI model called, uh, still called BARD, but it's now based on a much uh, more advanced uh, deep learning model and is much more capable than the, uh, than the previous BARD, which was, as they say, weak T. Uh, they've also committed to rolling this out in most of their major project products. So you'll be seeing this before year's end, uh, that's their plan, seeing this uh, popping up uh, in your Gmail, if you're using Gmail, uh, to you know draft initial answers for you. It'll be in Doc, it will be in Sheets. Uh, it will, uh, uh, so you're going to be seeing it in, in quite a few areas. Same thing with Microsoft. They're planning on, on rolling out uh, their AI. And remember, they've partnered with OpenAI. So they have ChatGPT and GPT-4. So you'll be seeing that, uh, not necessarily timeline there, but you'll be, start be seeing that in, in Outlook as well. So you'll start seeing these models ubiquitously. It's not going to just be a particular web page that you go to to try it out. You'll be seeing it in the tools uh, that you use every day. And hopefully you'll also get a chance to rewatch a recorded version of this video. I think we're recording it and we'll do a little light editing and put it out. So everybody who wasn't able to join for the whole time, or if there's certain things you'd like to go back and look at in more detail, you'll be able to do that in the not too distant future as well. And, and if there's questions that we didn't answer, you can probably check the transcript and then ask ChatGP to answer them as if we had answered them. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, there will be, I believe, a recording posted probably on Vanderbilt's YouTube channel. And um, if you have more questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'd love to stay engaged with everybody. Thank you. Thank you.